Good morning. Man, it's so good to see all of you. This is like a family reunion, so I'm glad that you're all here. It's very exciting. Um, I'm David Van Dyke, head of the Marriage and Family Therapy Program here, if you don't know me. Um, we've dreamt about this day for quite a while here. We're excited to have a, uh, a conference that looks at systemic integration, looking at kind of relational theories and how Christianity fits with that. Um, we want to focus our time on a systemic view of relationships and how it has impact for our profession and for church communities. Um, the idea is that we're wanting to focus on this transformation, transforming power of relationships and how that is seen through our relationship with Jesus in and through it. So we want to bring together the best of science and the best of our theology and who better than to have Dr. Jim Furrow here to do that. Um, I'm very excited. He's a good friend. We've known each other for about 21 years, and uh, he still calls me friend, which makes me very, very happy. Uh, it shows me the transformational power of relationship, uh, Jim living that out with me. Uh, he is the Frank and Evelyn uh, Freed Chair um, at Fuller Theological Seminary in Marriage and Family Therapy. He's a certified, uh, certified what? Uh, well, I have a couple of other ideas, but yeah, certified trainer, supervisor, and uh, clinician in EFT. He travels the world uh, doing this training, and he's actually going to be leaving the continent soon to do this training overseas, and so we're very fortunate to have him. Um, and I'd just like to welcome Jim to talk to us about EFT and Christianity. It is... Uh Indeed, a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for taking your Saturday morning to spend here with me talking about redeeming relationships. I, I don't know if grammatically it's better to say redemptive relationships, but I, I prefer the gerund of redeeming relationships because I'm, I think one of the main emphases of today will be wanting to invite you to think about redemption as a Christian not as a state, but a process. And in that way, when we're talking about thinking systemically, we're thinking about the ways in which there are properties of a system that we're a part of that are always moving, that are always changing, that are always growing, that are always healing, they're always transforming. And we think about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we think about the work of the Holy Spirit in our relationships, one of the ways that we want to think about that is, you know, is, is to use a fancy theological term, an eschatological perspective. It's, we know where we're going, but we're not there yet. And the reality of a redemption is, is that it's true, and it's, it's happened, and it's, it's, the kingdom is a reality for our lives today. So when we think from a kingdom perspective about our relationships, and we think about something like commitment or forgiveness or uh, these terms that are so commonplace in our work or our lives of the church, and when we think about bringing those into the work that we do clinically, um, what I want to keep alive is this idea that uh, it really does matter to think about the process of healing within the larger framework of what God has already done, what God is doing um, in the work that we're doing with others, but also in the work that God is doing in our lives. So, Thus, the title, Redeeming Relationships, helps frame for me at least a way of thinking about this process of change that I'm a part of, both as a clinician who is working with people in relationships that matter most in their lives, but also the idea that's really important to the process, in my opinion, is that God is redeeming me. God is changing me. God is using the people that I work with to help me see what he's doing in their lives, but also what he's doing in my own. Does that make sense to you? So just a little bit about me. Um, Greg, some of you may be familiar with Greg Lavoie, who's written um, significant work on calling and helping people discover their journey. And one of his exercises that he uses with people to sort of help them find where they are is to say, imagine yourself standing in an intersection or a fork in the road where there are two, two paths going in uh, different directions. And if you were to look at the street sign, what would you see on those signs? 
In other words, if you were to identify two core values that shape who you are and what you do, what would those be? And for me, uh, reconciliation and transformation are, is where the intersection happens for me, both professionally, but personally. It's my sense of calling. It's what draws me to the field. It's what really draws me to integration, ultimately, is I want a front row seat for the work that God is doing. And if I were to, uh, to tell you the truth in my fantasy, I, I, I want to be um, an agent of redemption, you know, a, a, a secret agent of redemption. Uh, my code name, Jason, born again. Okay, <laughs> all right. This, no, seriously. So myself, um, I got into this whole business of, uh, of family therapy largely through an interest in communication. I took a family communication class in my undergrad. I was a communication major. I was thinking about television and radio broadcasting. Um, and uh, that just captured my attention. And the idea of interviewing people about current events just didn't seem quite as interesting as talking them talking to people about their lives. And also, uh, at that period of time, I had four friends, uh, all good friends from high school, all get married the same year and all get divorced the same year. And uh, that really captured my attention because I cared about each of those people, I cared about all of their relationships, and I felt really like any conversation I had with them about trying to help them in that moment was futile. Uh, I just really didn't have what it took to make a difference either in helping them walk through this journey of suffering that they were going through, or to try to influence in some ways an impact change. So that really captured my attention and helped me begin to think about uh, the work that I wanted to do and the contribution that I wanted to make in terms of the process of change and healing and participate perhaps in what God is doing in the world through his redemptive mission. And so for me, when I come to therapy, one of the things that's in the back of my mind particularly in the context of relationships, is that God has a redemptive purpose in the world. And he invites us into that process with him. And so I want to be wide-eyed, looking for those opportunities to participate in what God is already doing in the lives of the people that I'm working with. So today, these are the objectives that um, continuing education requires us to have, yes. Um, and this will just sort of give you a, a flow for where we're going to go today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how integration, emotion is an integral factor in, in positive relationship science. I want to just use a positive frame for thinking about the work that we do in therapy rather than the classic sort of negative clinical model. Because I think one of the things that, from an emotionally focused perspective, we really organize around human potential and human strengths. And so we look at the capacities, and I like to think of it this way, it's humanistic, and some people for, from a Christian perspective, particularly from a reform perspective, maybe struggle sometimes with the idea that you can actually think in a humanistic way about, um, but I, I like to hold on to creation uh, as strongly as I hold on to the fall. Um, I like to believe that um, these, the, there are God-given capacities that are embedded in what it means to be created in the image of God that are still true about us even though the world that we live in and the relationships we have have fractures and are broken um, that sin both corporately and personally has had an impact on those relationships. But those core important processes are God-given, God-ordained, and I would say available for our use in the process of therapy. I want to use attachment as a way of conceptualizing the processes that are associated both with distress, but also as a resource. So an attachment frame provides us a way of looking at relationship interactions in couples and families that tell us about what's the problem, but also what is the solution and how we can help families in that way. And then to think from a systemic perspective about change and, trans and the power of creating transforming emotional experiences. Um, Dan Siegel talks about emotion as being energy and information, and so, when I think about a transforming emotional experience, I'm bringing new energy and new information into a relationship that transforms and brings about change. And finally, uh, and most importantly to this particular presentation this morning is to explore how faith offers clients and clinicians 
And I would say that again. It's not, integration is not simply about clients. Um, and perhaps I might even argue, first and foremost, about the person of the uh, clinician. Um, you, and again, I mean, you are the agent of change in the process. Um, you, you bring something unique uh, and you bring uh, the presence of Christ um, in the work that you do, regardless of your theoretical model. It'd be my opinion that your faithfulness to God's faithfulness, even in the uncertainty of a, a client's struggle, a family struggle, a couple's struggle, is an opportunity for hope, healing, and transformation. So that's what we'll explore together. So if I were to give a roadmap of sort of the main path that we're going to follow, it, it goes along this basic idea that I believe that belonging leads to becoming. That we start with connection before we go to correction, right? We, we start with connection before we go to growth. And we see that with children, and I think we see that in the process of therapy, and we'll see that in the model that I unfold for you today. And, and so I'm gonna, these are some of my core assumptions, that correlational processes are intrinsic to human flourishing. And this is this idea that we have these God-given resources. That resilience is a necessary and insufficient condition for flourishing. Uh, Ann Mastin, the University of Minnesota, talks about um, resilience as being an ordinary magic. Right? It's not just, resilience is not just for people who are attractive and intellectual or have strong intellects. Um, or in advantage positions, but you know, if you really look across human, uh, the human experience, that resilience itself is very ordinary. But it's not, resilience doesn't lead to thriving. It's a step along the way. Resilience requires social embeddedness. We, we, don't, we aren't resilient alone, it requires relationships. So we're looking for the strengths that people have and actuating those strengths in the context of relationships. Resilience is an ordinary response to suffering and adversity. Those of you who are familiar with George Bonanno's work, um, studying the trauma and loss, specifically looking at the impact of 9-11 on first responders, but also people in the community, has found and over time that the largest response of people who were exposed to the traumatic effect was resilience, right? So that actually in a clinical environment, it often seems that trauma is expected, PTSD uh, or related symptoms are expected when any trauma event happens. And actually his science would say um, resilience is the most common response to trauma, not uh, complicated bereavement, not PTSD. So I want to suggest to you that when we think about this, not only resilience is ordinary magic, but we also see in the context of suffering and adversity that resilience is the most common response. Resilience is both an agent and evidence of God's redemptive purpose. So I don't, I don't want to just think about resilience as something that's human, but I also want to think about it as something that could be purposeful if we think about what God is doing in redeeming the world. Not just redeeming individuals, but God is actively redeeming the world. And if you know something about N.T. Wright and his work, that's influencing theologically where I'm coming from. That when we think about redemption it's, and justification, we're not just thinking about that as something God did at Calvary, established a change for us through Jesus Christ, and that's a matter of fact. But in fact, what it is is that plus an ongoing work of sanctification that's happening in our lives. So justification provides a way for thinking about God's redemptive work in our lives, but also God's redemptive work in the world. So it should not surprise us fundamentally to see that God is at work even before we're at work. Does that make sense to you? That we are stumbling into the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of clients that we see, both Christian and non-Christian, I would be of the opinion, right? You don't have to have a Christian card to get Christian healing, right? You don't have to be part, a member like Costco, right? You don't, you, you know, <laughs> sorry, you can't have services, you know, you don't have the card, but, um, but God's, through God's common grace, 
pouring out on the lives of all, all his creation he loves, we would expect healing and transformation. And finally, redemptive relationships promote human flourishing through acts of resilience. So it's, resilience is, insu- and it is an insufficient, it's necessary, but it's an insufficient condition. So it, it, we're a step along the way. That's what I think about therapy. We're a step along the way. We create, and particularly as an emotionally focused therapist, one of the things I'm thinking about is how I create moments of change that transform possibilities for relationships that will happen in the future. I create a new experience that gives them hope for more experiences like that experience is to come. Essentially, what I'm doing is putting them back on the path of trajectory of growth and thriving and healing, what God intended in their life. Okay? So that's sort of how I'm thinking about this, but I want to invite a conversation just briefly uh, with at least two or, th- or no more than three people, just so if you could turn to a person next to you. When you think about the process of healing, and you're engaging, some of you may be working in a church context, some of you in clinical context, um, but when you think about the process of healing, what does the process of healing look like? If you were to put two or three words to it, I don't want a, an essay right now, we don't have time for that, so just two or three words in your summary of what does the process of change or healing look like in the work that you do, in the conversations with you, you have with people you're trying to help. Where are you going? What's the end state? How do you know it's done, right? What do you look for as a sign or a marker that change has occurred? So I'm interested for you to say something about the process, something about where you're going, something about your role, okay? What's your role in that process? How do you think of yourself? Do you think of yourself as a coach? Do you think of yourself as a teacher? Do you think of yourself as a shaman, a wise person? Do you think of yourself as magic? (laughs) Maybe on a good day. A miracle worker, what's your role? And then finally, what does faith have to do with any of that? The process, the outcome, you, okay? So I'm just gonna invite you, that's a, you know, probably a three hour conversation, Uh, but we'll, we'll take about 10 minutes or so to have some conversation. So introduce yourself to the person next to you or somebody around you if you don't know them. Take a few minutes and, and, and pick up one, at least one of these, these comments that, that's interesting to you and, and talk about that with your. One of my colleagues, uh, Terry Hargrave at Fuller Seminary would say, uh, is, uh, often says in our classes together that uh, theory is for the therapist, therapy is for the client. Um, the theories that we use help us organize our own understanding of the work that we do, and they're important. So taking a moment to identify what your assumptions are and, and how you see the work that you do um, and how you think about that in a systematic way is important. I want to do that with you from an EFT perspective. I don't do that in a way that as a, you know, I'm trying to, I'm passionate about the model. I care about this way of working. I don't see it as the only way to work, and I'm not trying to be persuasive in that. It just passionate. So, um, but saying that then I think gives me permission to, you know, try to be as explicit about what I understand the change process to look like, where we're going in the process of therapy, and to, to offer that as a way of thinking to you in your own work. Um, the therapist role, I, you know, the literature is consistent um, repeatedly over time that the, the explanatory, the factor that has the most explanatory variance in treatment outcome is not the theory, um, it's the therapist. And so we repeatedly see that finding over and over and over again. So it seems like it's very important for us as we think about the work that we do to think about us, who we are, um, and how we come to relationships with clients. And finally, the, the question of integration is not just our question, it's a shared question. The role of faith in the process of therapy is not just for the therapist, it's for the client as well. It's for the work that we're doing. And I think from a systemic perspective, if you can take the idea of non-summativity, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, that God is in the midst of something bigger than what we see happening in our office. And sometimes it's just a matter of us being first and foremost aware of that and taking opportunity as it comes to be part of things that we don't fully understand, but we show up faithfully to be part of. And um, that's what our role is. 
And, but again, I would operate from the assumption that, and what I'm arguing for it today is that an eschatological vision, we know the end of the story, it's just not yet happened. But we're gonna be faithful to the story by being present to what God might wanna do in ways that we expect by virtue of our theory and in ways that we anticipate that the Holy Spirit will do in their lives. So, for an end state from EFT, if we want to say where we're going in EFT, it's to create these corrective emotional experiences. This is what Sue John, how Sue Johnson describes it. The stated goal of attachment-informed therapy has often been to change internal working models. You know, the ways that we see ourselves and the way that we see others. That's an internal working model. EFT assumes that the fastest way to change such models is by new corrective emotional experiences that are placed in the context of and used to transform attachment responses. So to unpack that slightly, we're not thinking that insight and understanding is the fastest way to change. It is a way to change, absolutely. And we're not thinking that changing behaviors and instructing people on how they can communicate differently is the fastest way to change. In fact, what we're saying is we create a secure environment in the therapeutic process that enables people to experience themselves and to experience their relationship differently. So from an emotion perspective, Sue Johnson likes to use the metaphor that emotion is the music and we're gonna change the dance that couples and families are doing by changing the music, right? And we're gonna do that at an emotional level. So corrective emotional experience is the sort of bedrock of this EFT approach, which we'll explore in a few minutes. But before we get there, what I want to do is at least frame for you um, an understanding about an argument that's starting to uh, emerge uh, around positive psychology. In 1998, Martin Seligman led the charge in the field of psychology to, to move away from just a clinical focus on oftentimes the study of negativity, the problems in our world, and move toward studying, you know, there, just in terms of the research itself, there was little in the area of studying love. There was little in the area of studying hope. There was little in the area of studying joy. There was little in the area of studying gratitude. Um, and these both positive practices and positive experiences that are part of human nature. And so he began to lead a charge to, to invite the profession into considering ways that we can think about the positive effects of our lives together and, and what we share and how therapy might be relevant to that. What's interesting in the way that positive psychology developed is, is that relationships and families, communities, churches, were um, one, uh, one way of thinking uh, about a context that supports these positive outcomes, but not a critical pillar in and of themselves. So one of the things that I want to think about is not just positive psychology, but a positive relationship science. When I think of the work in EFT, one of the things that we're working toward is creating these sort of transformational moments. And we're focused on healing, but not just correcting, but we're, we're actually broadening and building, right? Because um, what, uh, if you think about a secure base from John Bowlby's perspective, a secure, our secure relationship offers a secure base and a safe haven. Those are resources in relationships for help other people grow and become. To deal with a crisis, not alone, but on the benefit and the support of another person, but not just dealing with a crisis, but also growing and becoming. The idea of a secure base is knowing that you have something secure to leave from enables you to go out and explore the world. And we see that in couples' relationships. We obviously see that in parent-child relationships. So from an attachment perspective, it makes good sense that we think about a positive relationship science. Um, one of the things Sue Johnson points to is that if you look back in the 1980s and the 1970s, much of the literature studying uh, couples' therapy was focused on conflict. There, was very, there were very few studies up until almost 2000s on the nature of love and the importance of love. We were obsessed with trying to fix problems, but not really inform where we were going. So more recent uh, social scientists have focused on what they call transformational processes, like forgiveness, like commitment, like 
sacrifice in a relationship. And seeing that those sort of key processes promote growth in the relationship. And if they do, we should want to understand how to facilitate that. And we can think about one of the things that we're doing is not just correcting problems for families, but helping families flourish, helping families thrive, helping them move toward what God intended them to be. So if you dig into the literature that supports these kind of arguments, then there are a couple of things that stand out in relationship to that that I'd like to point to that are related to how we think about EFT. First of all, we don't, you know, the argument that emotions are positive or negative really doesn't stand up with the science anymore. It's really better to think about them as two dimensions, that you have a positive, you have low positive emotion and high positive emotion. You have low negative emotion and you have high negative emotion, but you don't have negative emotion on one end of the continuum and positive emotion on the other, right? So, and that helps us think about the nature of, you know, so John Gottman, many of you are familiar with his work and his ratio of five to one that in studying these marital interactions where conflict was present, that he can tell the difference between a regulated couple interaction versus an unregulated couple interaction by the ratio of positive interactions to negative interactions that they have in their interaction together, right? So the five to one ratio, as long as you have that in a 15 minute period, you pretty much maintain stability emotionally. So, and he uses um, dynamical systems theory to help explain this, which suggests that you know, if you maintain that five to one ratio, the climate of your relationship is largely warm, right? Think about a thermostat, you know? it, it's correcting itself. So if something negative comes up, in an interaction, then somebody may make a joke in response to that, and the other person lightens up in response. And so that interaction, as it plays ar out around a difficult topic, remains on the positive end of the continuum, on that positive ratio, what some people will call a positive offset, right? Some of you are familiar with Barbara Fredrickson's work and the idea that she has that, uh, that, that positive emotions and maintaining a balance, an offset of about 20 to one is associated individually with thriving and well-being among individuals. So that we as individuals do better in our experience of the world when we are able to maintain and sustain a more positive emotional experience. Now, it wouldn't be correct to take Gottman's finding of five to one and say, okay, I have a couple sitting in front of me and I'm gonna try to um, every time, I'm going to count the number of negative interactions and I'm going to try to counter them with, with positive. So I'm going to coach people to be more positive. That's not exactly correct understanding of what Gottman's finding was. Because what Gottman is describing is what people do together. It's how their interaction, how they impact each other. It's something more than the sum of the parts. It's how they play and work together. And so the literature on couples therapy, for example, would say there are really two states that couples find themselves in. One is um, a satisfied state. The other is a distressed state. And it's almost like a light switch. Like the couples that come in to see me in therapy or come in to see you in therapy, the literature would suggest that they've waited at least six years to come in from the first signs of distress. Um, and so things have been on the stove, they've been cooking for a while, and now they come to see you, they want something different in their relationship because their relationship doesn't feel like it used to. What they are describing when they use words like that is that something has changed in the way that we are together. That's not just a pattern of behaviors, right? It's, it's a consistent, saturated, negative experience that they find themselves continually going toward and not finding themselves um, being able to get out of. So when we think about this relational flourishing and this positive science of emotion, one of the things that we're thinking about are what are the processes that we can put in place that can move a couple or a family or a family interaction from this negative place where basically in a negative state what gets confirmed is negative things. Right? In a positive relationship, what gets confirmed is positive things. So take, for example, a couple that comes into my office, and um, he was 
um, at the grocery store picking up a few things and saw, a flower, and saw some flowers and said, you know, I just want to show her that I'm thinking about her. So he picks up a bouquet of flowers, brings them home with the groceries, walks in, his wife is sitting there looking at him, and he walks in and he sort of does a ta-da, he brings the flowers out from behind the back grocery bag and says, ta-da, um, here, awkward, here, hoping that she would see the signal, and she said, what did you do now? Right? Different couple. The same scenario. Guy comes home thinking about his wife, sees some flowers, um, you know, She's the daisy of my delight. And so she gets daisies, comes home, does this move, and before he can all, it, it's, before it's in full view, her face lights up. <sighs> she doesn't say anything. He's like, and, and the moment's already there, right? It, it, the words don't need to be exchanged. She knows exactly what the signal is because the signal is clear. The problem in a negative relationship is you can have a positive signal, but because of the noise in that relationship, people don't know what to do with that, right? And, and it's the consistency of that pattern repeating itself over and over and over again that leads to the erosion of connection in that relationship. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so flowers are good things. But they exist in, and, and these sort of positive actions exist in these emotional climates that we're seeking to impact. Now, so I've talked a bit about emotions and these positive cycles and the ways that they influence that. Now, I, I want to point to one process in particular that this positive relationship science, this whole, all this thinking is, is interested in when it comes to couples relationships in particular. That is this area of commitment. And I think it's an interesting question because one of the first points of assessment in working with couples is really getting a clear angle, a clear read on what are they committed to about working on their relationship. Do they want to make their relationship better? Is one person sort of coming into therapy to drop their partner off and the last act of benevolence in their relationship here, help them out as I leave, right? That's, that's happened to couples therapists all the time. So really understanding if that person's got one foot in the relationship and one foot out, or if they're really working to try to find a new way in their relationship. It's this assessment of commitment. And I think commitment in our, our time is, is kind of a confusing idea, you know, in terms of how couples are thinking about what does it mean? What are we committed to in our relationship? So I want to explore that, and I want to do that from a theological angle as well as a psychological angle. So digging a little deeper in this, um, psychologists have suggested that there are two types of commitments in relationship. There's personal dedication commitment, where people make sacrifices and invest in their relationship. And there's also constraint commitment. Like people stay in relationships because of the cost of leaving that relationship and what it would mean to them to lose companionship, perhaps morally that if they left the relationship that that would violate some moral premise that they have, or perhaps they have children together, so the negative impact of leaving the relationship. And so that holds them together. Constraint commitment isn't bad, but it's not an investment in the relationship. So when we think about types of commitment, one of the things that I'm listening for when a couple comes into my office in the very first session is do they describe their relationship only in constraint language? Is there any sign that they're thinking about dedication? Right, the investments, the sacrifices that they're making in relationship to each other. Bill Doherty suggests that one of the things that's um, in an article that he wrote, how mar marital therapy can be hazardous to your marriage. And it was a provocative essay that he wrote because he, one of the things he wanted to point attention to is, is that a lot of couples go to see in, therapists who are trained to work with individuals and don't have an idea about how to frame uh, a couple session that focuses on their relationship. And so what, what's important in his argument and important in our discussion is that when a couple's therapist works with a couple, uh, one of the things that they have in primary view is not each individual's commitment to themselves. That's important, right? 
what's important to each person, but we're also interested in paying attention to what's the couple's commitment to each other, to the relationship they have. And we want to join that commitment, we want to expand that commitment, we want to develop that commitment. As I mentioned, um, there's some confusion about what commitment means and what marriage means in our society today. If you look at the demographics, one of the things that you'll see is the marriage rates have have declined significantly over the last 50 years. Um, Cohabitation rates have increased significantly over the last 20. Divorce rates peaked in 1981 and remain relatively stable, although in somewhat of a decline. So those people who, sociologists who study these demographic patterns, uh, started to ask the question, has the value of marriage changed in our society today? How people think about it? And some have argued that marriage has moved from an arrangement of commitment to an arrangement of achievement. In other words, people wait to get married now until they have a certain level of economic success, that they have a certain lifestyle. And so weddings have become more celebrations of what the couple has already achieved rather than the start of their relationship. Which is an interesting pattern of how people are changing how they think about being together. And one of the aspects of that is is that they tend to evaluate, and again, these are sociologists who are making this argument, that they tend to evaluate their relationship not based on the benefits of the relationship as a whole, but out of what, but based on what they get out of it personally. So the quality of a relationship is not, is it good for us, is it good for our children, but is it good for me? And so this idea of a pure relationship, the primary value is not having a family, it's not having a sense of community or companionship, it really is, is this good at for me? Is this beneficial for me? So self-fulfillment becomes a primary criteria. One of the factors that I think might set this up is our uh, culture's fascination with destiny. Sleepless in Seattle, serendipity. Uh, you, I, we could start a list, right, of all the different roman- rom-com movies that draw thousands to the fantasy that there's a right person out there for you. So it's ironic to me that in the changing dynamics of marriage, we still have some stability when it comes to the idea that, you know, there is a right person for me, and that person is waiting. I need to find them. Once I find them, ah, bliss. So Gallup poll was done in early 2000s, found that 94% of the people polled in America believe uh, that they wanted their partner to be a soulmate. 88%, uh, almost nine out of 10, believe that there is a special person, a soulmate waiting there for you somewhere out in time. Almost the same percentage believe that they will find their soulmate when they're ready to marry, like they'll just pop up, (laughs) right? And only 6% believe that it's unlikely that they'll stay married to the same person for life. It's really dramatic to look at the demographic factors and trends and then these assumptions that people make. Well, we live in a consumerist society. We live in a market-based society. And one of the things that you're told every day is the importance of you making choices for your own benefit, right? That's how we sell everything from laundry detergent to college degrees. Right? No, except at Wheaton, of course. But, uh, right, right. But, but you're continually reminded of the importance of your choice to your benefit. And that shows up in how people think about marriage. That shows up in how people think about relationship. Consider the following. Uh, this is from Will Willimon, who's uh, a theologian. Uh, when p- choosing to marry, most people think that the toughest part of marriage is deciding whom we ought to marry, making the right choice. We say we're deciding whether or not we are in love with this person, whether or not we're emotionally attached. The problem with that view is that we marry the wrong person. Right? We are conditioned to think that the only what is right for us is right for ourselves. 
The trouble with such a view is that marriage like parenting requires that we make sense out of being stuck with certain people <laughs> for no good reason or justification, right? Um, Stanley Hauervoss is the one who said, you know, we marry the wrong people. And what he, what he meant by that is that we often find ourselves, or you often find couples in relationships 10, 20 years down the road, sitting across the table from the other person saying, this is not what I thought when I got married to you. Right? I didn't think that you were going to lose your job and that you were going to cope with that by becoming an alcoholic and that I was going to end up having to carry this relationship. That wasn't what I had in mind. Um, Willeman goes on to say, uh, but right here, this being stuck with people for no good reason or uh, no good justification, right there is a glimpse of us at our best. For right there is where we learn to be faithful to love strangers, even though we did not choose them as someone we might have liked to love. But the trick is preparing for a lifetime of commitment to someone who is always changing. You can't prepare for how annoying another person can be. And because you can't, what you need is some means for being part of an adventure which you can't control, the end of which you do not fully understand. And then he concludes, morally, we move into the future on the basis of commitments which we made without knowing what we were getting into. I'll repeat that. Morally, we move into the future on the basis of commitments which we made without knowing what we were getting into. That's the nature of marriage, not the right choice. It's really, you know, I mean, choice is important, obviously. Mate selection is an important factor in the trajectory of a relationship. But when we begin to think about what marriage requires, it's the decisions that couples make every day that make that relationship a reality, right? It's, that's what he's talking about here is this, this idea of these moral commitments that we make in the context of uncertainty. Social scientists have studied uh, religious relationships, and one of the things that they note is that couples who have what they call sanctification or creating a spiritual significance for uh, their relationship, their family life, they see those relationships as having spiritual importance. For example, they see that God is present in their marriage or that my marriage is influenced by God's actions in our lives. Or someone said, my marriage is symbolic of God and what I believe about God that couples who have these sanctified views have greater positivity in their relationship. They have greater satisfaction. They have more positive behaviors in their relationship. Um, they buffer stress better when they have these sanctified views of their relationship. So it may really, I mean, at least there's a psychological case, it does matter how we see our relationships and what their purpose is, and perhaps whether God is present in our relationship. As Christians, we oftentimes talk about marriage not just as a social contract, where you're negotiating two people who legally agree to form this partnership for, the, for each of their mutual benefit, but we think about, if we use a, a theological perspective, we'll often talk about the promises that a couple makes as being in line with the promises that God makes expressed to, in this case uh, initially to Abraham to make a people, right? So this is from Genesis 17, seven to eight. I'll establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are and are now an alien, I will, I will get, I will give in, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it really is bad form to, to not get your scripture right, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I need uh, a corrective emotional experience, I think. Um, uh, an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. God promises possession of the land. God promises a future, but God promises an ongoing enduring relationship. God promises identity to the people to be his. Um, there are aspects of these, this covenantal understanding that we can make sense of marriage. If you think about marriage being a covenant, there is initiation of love. It comes, that covenant is an expression of love first. There's an avow of consent. There is a promise being made. 
Uh, there's obligations expected. If you're going to be mine, then you need to um, follow and we need to work together. Uh, there's a promise of blessing and there's an anticipation of sacrifice. So when we think about covenant relationships in Christian marriage, for example, uh, one way that theologians talk about this is they use the language of covenant fidelity. And what I think is helpful about this is that it spreads out the idea of covenant is not being something that's just about a relationship, but it's about who we are as people. Karl Barth uh, described covenant fidelity as the inner meaning and purpose of being created in God's image. What it means for us to be human beings created in God's image is that we make promises to one another. We're oriented to offering ourselves to others. Paul Ramsey describes this as the unconscious acceptance of these covenant responsibilities is the inner meaning of what it means to be natural or systemic relations into which we were born. So these are, our God-given tendency is to commit to others in the face of uncertainty for something better as a result of that. I mean, that's what love is, is these promises that we make even though we don't have guarantees. Right? And a lot of the emphasis on Match.com and, and the compatibility science that we have to match people is to buffer against the risk of divorce. Right? The idea is that marriage itself is an unstable institution in our society, so you need to get the best help that you can to find somebody that you can make it with a long haul because people generally don't get married to get divorced. They get married because they believe that their marriage is going to last. But that is often premised on, going back to Willimon's idea, that the choice of who I marry is more important than how I live, right? The process of marriage itself becomes more important. And from a Christian perspective, when we think about the process of marriage, we're thinking about the process as being covenant-making and covenant-keeping. Right? Because what we're trying to illustrate in our own lives, or what we're trying to be part of in our own lives, is the faithfulness of God. Because it's not just our covenant. Right? Marriage is a God-given creation. It's an institution that was created by God for us. It's a promise of fulfillment. And so we enter something that's not our own, that we're shaped by. And covenant is a way of thinking about this. David Atkinson, in his book, To Have and to Hold, where he writes about marriage and divorce in a thoughtful way, I believe, uh, says this, the primary task of the Christian church is to enable and foster the growth of such relationships which in marriages can and do declare the meaning and character of God's covenant relationships. So that a vital, thriving marriage is a symbol to the world of God's faithfulness and God's love. Right? So this going back to the idea of sanctification, it really not only matters psychologically why you see God as a part of your relationship or why you might see your relationship as having specialness because it's covenant, but it actually matters theologically. It matters eschatologically that we love one another in our families in ways that tell the gospel story. Right? that show that our commitment to each other is not just growing out of our own personal interest, but is out of some kind of higher moral vision, which we find in, in covenant. Walter Brueggemann, when he talks about in his Old Testament theology, one of the things that he points to is the idea that how do people respond in covenant relationships? Well, covenant relationships require us to listen and obey Right? There's a certain aspect in listening where you submit to the other person. You have to take, you have to preference them. You have to put them ahead of yourself. You have to say, what they're saying right in this moment is more important than what I am thinking, if you are going to listen. And a covenant relationship gives preference to the other. A covenant relationship is not just slavish obedience, though. It's not unqualified submission. Because even in Israel's relationship with God, you see various figures like Moses protesting God's intended action to wipe out the people. And, and Moses says, well, that's not really your character, God. So when the golden calf is cast, uh, Moses pleads in protest against God 
intent to destroy the people, and God relents. So Brueggemann would make the point that even in our relations where covenant is organizing the relation, it's not just a matter of listening to the other person without having a voice. It's not unqualified submission. And finally, and I think most importantly, and will inform where I go with our, our, as we move into talking about clinical, the clinical process of EFT, is that a covenantal relationship, having knowledge and participating in that level of commitment creates a security. Uh, as Brueggemann says, a primal trust. That I know who I belong to and I know that I matter. Right? I know I'm important. I know that I matter. And so when we read the Psalms, one of the things we're struck by is all the images that are used for God as a fortress, as a stronghold, as a, as a source of security, right? And that God is a shepherd. God is one who cares for us. And so we have this language of a secure base and a safe haven, even in the Psalms. One last point on this before we um, sort of leave this sort of theological conversation uh, is made by Walter Brueggemann. He says that we all have a hunger for certitude, and the problem is that the gospel is not about certitude. It's about fidelity. You know, we want to take the risk out of relationships, right? We want to know what the other person's going to be like and, and what's going to happen, um, but that's not the nature of things. Uh, so Brueggemann says, so what we all want to do, if we can, is immediately transpose fidelity into certitude. Move away from promises to facts. Because fidelity is a relational category and certitude is a flat mechanical category. So we have to acknowledge our thirst for certitude and then recognize that if you had all the certitude in the world, it would not make the quality of your life any better because what we really have to have in our lives is fidelity, right? I mean, because you could create a contract in a relationship and you could draw, uh, take a piece of paper and you could divide it in half and you can say, you will do these things and I will do these things and we will have a great marriage, sign on the dotted line. And, no, and if that was made into a movie, nobody would come to watch it because that isn't love, is it? That doesn't feel like love. That is not what we think about when love. Love is what happens in the context of uncertainty. Love is what happens when people show up in unexpected ways. Love is when there's sacrifice and one gives oneself to the other person in ways that the other person doesn't merit or deserve. Right? So when we think about the gospel showing up in relationship, we think about what God has done for us. We think about grace played out in the context of relationships, marriages and families. It's in those moments of fidelity that we see with clarity God's presence, God's purpose, God's redemption. Does that make sense to you? Okay. I want to pause for a moment to see if there is any, uh, any question or if you'd like to raise a question or have a comment or relationship to that because that, this is part of my integrative framework that I want to offer to you before we sort of move into talking about sort of the uh, clinical science of EFT and its practice. But I wanted to just sort of provide that framework for a way for us to look at commitment as covenant and use that as an organizing framework for our work with our clients. But I just want to make sure that if you have a question uh, or a comment, that there's space for you to interact with me on that. Yes? Absolutely. Right, because especially if you think about um, what, I mean, if you take the idea of what Brueggemann is saying, that we strive for, we want to organize around certitude, but we always hope for something more than that, right? That's not restricted to someone's, I mean, that's just part of who we are. That's, if, you, if you use 
the Imago Dei and creation as the base for it, um, then you don't have to say, well, only a Christian or only somebody who has been converted is going to want that or value that. No, it's actually, it's actually what's drawing us to God. Because the covenant is not like, it's not a contract. So it's, it's not something that's out there that we're obligated to. But it's an invitation to a type of relationship that gives us purpose and meaning. That gives us belonging. That gives us a future. So God invites us into his world, into who, what he's doing. Um, and he's promised that he will make a place for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the nature of things, right? It's the nature of things. And that, to me, is why a good uh, couple therapy, um, if you want to think about evangelism in the context of clinical work, don't think about um, evangelism or asking questions about people's faith commitments as a part of therapy, but think about transforming their relationship as a sign and symbol of God's work in their life and setting them on the path toward asking questions about what does it mean now that I experience love in this way, when that love is congruent and consistent with the love of God, right? I think that, because I think that is more consistent with the work that we're doing, because evangelism is not therapy, right? It's transformation, and therapy, therapy can be transformation, but not done that way. It's a different practice, if you will. Okay? All right. Then let me, we're going to take a break. Uh, what'd you say? Five minutes? Okay. Well, let, let me just, uh, let's go about 10 minutes and then we'll take a break. So, uh, Lev Vygotsky, Russian developmentalist, uh, argues that. It's through others that we become ourselves. Uh, and what I want to talk about right for a moment is the idea that when we talk about this covenant fidelity, one of the things we may be observing is, an, uh, from a psychological perspective, is intersubjectivity. Again, it's just another way of being able to describe what takes place when two people come together in a relationship of commitment to each other is that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. And that there's a lot of neuroscience-oriented uh, findings that continually point to the idea that the thoughts that we have are shared as much are they, as they are individual. So there's a concept called distributed cognition, where, um, where ideas exist outside of the person. They exist in a shared environment. You know, so if you have two people say, well, we're of the same mind of this, right? We have the same way of thinking about this. We have the same way of thinking about our marriage. Where is their mind? Is it in each person? Or is it in between both people? Right? There's a shared awareness. There's a shared understanding. And so this is not an uncommon concept if you dig deeper into some of the science that's um, in relationships and in interpersonal interaction. And I just want to point to a couple of ideas so when we talk about emotional regulation, for example, we can talk about the regulation that happens within each individual, but also that's auto-regulation, but we can also talk about co-regulation, what they do together, how they share emotion together. So Donald Winnicott, for example, this uh, important quote, what does the baby see when he or she looks at the mother's face? I am suggesting that ordinarily what the baby sees is himself or herself. In other words, the mother is looking at the baby and what she looks like is related to what the baby sees there, right? So if the mother sees delight, if, if, if the mother has an expression of delight on her face, what does the baby see? I am delightful, right? They have a positive sense of themselves reflected through the face of the other person, right? This is an intersubjective experience, right? So Alan Shore, who studies the sort of neuroscience of relationship and attachment, 
has made the case that rather than view, and he applies this to couples, that may be true of a mother and an infant, and you say, well, an infant doesn't know how to speak. They don't have the cognitive development to have a sense of self-representation, so they rely on the relationship for their own identity, their own sense of selfhood. And so, but that's gonna develop and that's gonna change. And so that's just something that happens between parents and infants. That's not something that happens with couples. Well, Shore would disagree. This is what Shore says, very similarly to what Winnicott says. Rather than viewing couples as two separate people, the contemporary neuroscience picture is of a single emotionally fused system whose coupled chemistry tunes the brains and the minds of each. Just as a caretaker's precise responses tune the brain and the mind of a newborn baby, so too do the dynamics of the couple set the stage either for well-regulated or dysregulated emotion with individuals. So, right, he walks in. Behind the grocery bag are the daisies. He pulls them out. She only has to see that there are flowers there and her face lights up like a Christmas tree. No words are exchanged, but they both know in that moment what's going on in their relationship, right? That's this intersubjective space, that they're tuned into each other and they're responding to each other in ways that make an emotional difference. John Bowlby argued that from cradle to grave, our happiest moments in life are organized by a series of excursions, long and short, from the secure base provided by our attachment figures. And those attachment figures aren't just our parents, right? Those attachment figures can be our partners, can be our spouses in relationships in adulthood. And that the systems that we inherit in infancy are the systems that we use in adolescence or the systems that we use in adulthood to connect, to deal with negative experiences, to exchange positive experiences. This attachment system is there from cradle to grave. Now, consistent with what I was saying about covenant is that covenant is premised on the idea of dependency, right? You're making a promise to the other person that they can depend on you and you can depend on them. Well, attachment theory has a similar kind of idea, what's called, some have called the dependency paradox, where the whole idea of accepting dependence leads to greater independence. The more effective we are at depending on other people, the more independent we become. Uh, psychology as a, a field has long been fascinated with autonomy, really at the exclusion of dependence, right? Dependence is bad, autonomy good. That doesn't make any sense to John Bowlby. John Bowlby would say dependence and autonomy are flip sides of the same coin. They're connected to each other. The more we depend, the more we explore. The issue is not dependency, it's whether the dependency is effective or not. Right? So when we talk about problematic dependency, one of the things that we're looking at is dependency that is out of balance. So when we think about what does effective dependency look like, well, we can look at these three characteristics. It's about someone being available when they are needed, right? not interfering with exploration. Right? So it's not about dependency that's intrusive. There's, an, there's also a spirit of encouraging exploration. And I, I, this is a little YouTube video um, and the sound will be soft on this, so if you guys could turn this up when it starts, uh, that in my mind illustrates very well this idea of a dependency paradox. See what you think. Oh. Oh. I need you. I don't need you. No. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> Yay! Excellent job. Right? I need you, I don't need you. I need you, I don't need you. Now, some of you might be going to borderline personality disorder right now, but I, I caution, I caution, I caution. I suggest that instead, we just recognize that how true is this of our own experience, that we're able to do more in life because of those people that we depend on. That the person that we are is better than they would be 
because of the people that we have depended on and that we rely on in our everyday relationships. So that's true in parenting, and you see that so wonderfully in this illustration, where, the, where the, in this case, the dad is, is there, uh, attentive, uh, accessible and responsive, but only when needed. And there are clear signals being sent between the child and the parent. I mean, how, how much clearer can you get than, I don't need you, right? <laughs> but the sense, and what I love about this little illustration is the sense of celebration that the family has as their daughter is able to navigate, you know, this monkey bars. And if you think about that as a metaphor for life, think about the wedding day when, you know, the father's walking the, um, her, his daughter down the aisle and, and she's saying, I need you. I don't need you, right? But I don't need you isn't rejection. It's actually growth. And that growth happened because they were able to depend on each other in an effective way. So when we talk about a secure base, that's going the wrong way here. Um, then it assumes that we all have a desire to maintain feelings of security as a universal goal. This happens in the early caregiver relationships and it sets up a way for us to understand and learn how to regulate negative emotions associated with threats to our own security. And we develop specific strategies to maintain feelings of security um, and those are shaped by the cultures that we are born in so, uh, and raised in. So one of the things that I'm thinking about, particularly as we uh, talk about doing clinical intervention with couples, is we're always thinking about how dependency and their relationships and intimacy are made sense of in a specific cultural context, right? Uh, cultures have their own rituals. Cultures have their own ways of expressing meaning. You know, in a North American culture, and an American culture, I think is very important. It can be a powerful intervention to have couples look at each other eye to eye. Um, and moments of intimacy, because that's a moment of connection. In other cultures, that would be offensive. So you wouldn't want to recognize, you wouldn't want to rec recommend the same practice in a culture where it doesn't make sense. But that being said, both cultures, from an attachment perspective, have the same needs. They just have different ways of expressing it. So when you're thinking about your work cross-culturally, one of the things you have to be sensitive to is the ways in which people express their emotions and connect with one another. So let's pause there. Let's take how long, David? Oh, ten, ten minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll look at a little bit more. And we'll jump into our, our conversation of, of uh, EFT and its practice.